So I just want to give you a brief overview of post-traumatic stress disorder and how we've made the invisible injury, as Rakesh has talked earlier about, into a more visible injury using neuroimaging, and then really end on a note of hope. And I really want to resonate, which was said earlier, that we have a lot of good treatments now. I think we need to learn a lot more, but I think we have an excellent start. Again, we know PTSD can result from a variety of traumatic events. Military exposure, of course, is the focus of today's event. But also motor vehicle accidents are a significant cause of post-traumatic stress disorder. First responders, as you can see here, police force, firefighters, paramedics. And I think it's great that there's increasing attention towards uh, these professions in terms of the risk they're at. And then I think we can't forget child abuse. It's a very unpleasant topic. It's a topic you often don't want to talk about, but it's a, certainly a major public health problem. And this can often predispose for later development of post-traumatic stress disorder after exposure to stressors. PTSD symptoms, we've heard them from Dr. Bradford uh, recently. Really, the core of post-traumatic stress disorder is that people don't remember the trauma, but rather they relive it. So it's not a memory of the past, even though it may have occurred years ago. It's really a memory of the present, where people experience all the intense emotional reactions they've had at the time of the trauma. This memory can be relived in the, in, during the daytime, as well as during reliving nightmares. PTSD until very recently was a fear disorder, but we've uh, realized that there are a lot more emotional reactions other than fear that uh, often agonize people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Guilt, shame, anger are three of the main emotions that often go along with fear reactions. And when we talk to our military personnel, we often find that they're absolutely crippled by feelings of guilt for what they have done. So how have we been transforming this invisible injury to a visible injury? And I think this is a really key part of reducing the stigma. And I think we've done a very good job to date. Again, we need to do better. But I think transforming this invisible injury to a visible one is absolutely necessary to reduce the stigma. So people don't feel, you know, it's all just in my head, I'm crazy, nobody else is experiencing this. And often when we do neuro neuroimaging with our patients and they understand there's actually changes in how their brain functions, it's an incredibly validating experience. So just to give you a brief illustration how differently people can respond even though they've been involved in the same accident, I want to discuss a case example from a couple uh, who was involved in a severe car accident about 15 years ago. They were driving from London, Ontario to Detroit on the 401. The, uh, the husband was driving, the wife was in the passenger seat, and it was a foggy day. All of a sudden, they hit this dense wall of fog. The husband slammed on the brakes, and within seconds, this was a several hundred car pileup, a large tractor trailer jammed into the back of their car. A van was pushed into the side of their car. There was a teenager in this van. The van was on fire. The teenager tried to escape from the van. She banged on the couple's car, screaming, help me out of the car, help me out of the car. And the couple witnessed the teenager burn to death. Both of the couple developed post-traumatic stress disorder after this event, but their experience during and after the trauma was quite different. The husband, during the tra uh, trauma already, during the accident, had sort of a hyperarousal response. He was intensely fearful and really planning how to get himself and his wife out of the car, which he was able to do. The wife, on the other hand, was numb and in shock, and she said, I was barely able to move, and if it hadn't been for my husband, I would never have gotten out of the car. And so they were referred to me for neuroimaging a month after the car accident. They both met criteria for PTSD, and so we got them to write a scenario, including as many sensory details of the car accident as possible, which was then read back to them while in the scanner. And for both of them, this really evoked a lot of intense memories about the accident, and they responded very similarly to the fact to the exactly the same way they had done at the time of the car accident. So I just want to show you their brain images quickly. 
first one is a brain image of the husband, and I'll just briefly describe a few areas that were active. The front part of the brain on the right was active, and this is the part of the brain that's involved in planning, and this may have been active because the man was actively tr trying how, planning how to get himself and his wife out of the car even when he was in the scanner reliving the accident. He also had activation of the back part of his brain, which is the visual cortex, which may be related to the fact that he was actually having visual flashbacks of the experience. In addition, his emotional brain, the amygdala, was intensely active, and this may be related to the fact that he had a hyperarousal response and was so fearful while recalling the accident. Now, his wife had a very different response, as we've already talked about. When she was in the scanner, she I also felt like she did at the time of the car accident. She was numb, in shock, and barely able to move. And her heart rate actually went down when she recalled the accident. And this is her brain scan. So as you can see, it's very different. The only area she activates is the visual cortex, the back part of the brain, which may be related to the fact that she was having visual flashbacks. So I think what this uh, shows us is that People can react very differently in response to trauma, and we really have to take that into consideration when we're doing biological research like this, because if we had averaged all these brain scans, we wouldn't have gotten anything out of them. So really taking into consideration subjective experience in relationship to our biological measures, I think is really important. I think also when we're dealing with military personnel and others, you know, to really distinguish these two, two responses. You know, the guy on the left, he's obviously hyper-aroused. He's in intense distress, right? That's easy to recognize. But the guy on the right, he's hypo-aroused, right? He's detached. He's numbed out. And that can have a huge impact on your relationship with loved ones, with your partner, with your children. And often people feel a tremendous amount of guilt because they can't feel the emotions that they're used to towards their loved ones. And the guy on the right, if you just look at him cursely, you might think, oh, he's okay. But he's suffering just as much and is having significant problems. So to recognize these two different responses, I think, is very, very important. I think it's important to screen for PTSD, and I think we have a lot of screening uh, uh, mechanisms in place. Again, I want to emphasize that there's hope. We have a number of very good treatment options now, both in terms of medications as well as in terms of psychotherapy. And I think we also have to keep in mind the number of treatment targets. So it's not just post-traumatic stress disorder, but we know that post-traumatic stress disorder often travels along with depression, alcohol and drug use, eating disorders, as well as mild or traumatic brain injuries also disability and quality of life. And I think in the end, when we treat somebody, we really want to change their quality of life. We don't just want to decrease their PTSD symptoms or their depressive symptoms. We really want to increase the quality of life. And I think really the key is to bring somebody more into the optimum zone of emotional arousal, right? We want to decrease that hyperarousal, but we also want to decrease that feeling of numbed out hypoarousal. So, in the first case, we want to decrease the emotional response, and in the other case, we want to bring the emotions back online to help somebody live in that op optimum zone of arousal where they can function optimally, both socially and occupationally. And this is often done in a stage-oriented trauma treatment approach. So the priorities, I think, and I just want to reiterate what's been said already this morning, include education, we can't intervene unless we're aware of the problem, both in terms of how it presents as well as how we can treat it. Prevention, really looking at predictors of illness, focusing on early intervention, and really focusing on continuing to reduce workplace stigma because that can be a significant barrier to the return to work. I want to end on a note of hope. This is one of my patients who had a tre tremendously difficult time but now is able to experience positive emotion and live in the present more. And what he says is, on a withered branch, a flower blooms. Thank you.